I just saw someone stumble out of the crowd uh, in front of me across the street. This was on Commonwealth Ave, probably about a half mile from the finish. She was in track clothes and wearing a number, but I thought someone had just sort of stumbled into the race. Maybe somebody was a little crazy or something. the women's winner in the Boston Marathon today with a time of 2.31 and change. Now, we don't know how many seconds that is. It may be a new American record. What was the time in your first ever marathon, and where was it? It was 2 hours and 56 minutes and 33 seconds in New York last year. So you improved from two, two hours and 56 minutes to two hours and 31 minutes. What, what, so. what do you attribute that improvement in time to? Um, I don't know. Uh. Have you been doing a lot of heavy intervals? Um, someone else asked me that. I'm not sure what intervals are. <laughs> what are they? Are, are track workouts that are designed to make your speed improve dramatically and if you went from a 256 to a 231 one would normally expect that you do a lot of speed work is, is someone coaching you or advising you uh, no I advise myself <laughs> well, it was a fantastic performance Rosie congratulations poses to both of you. Rosie, there are those that say that your improvement in time is impossible. Now, uh, Bill, have you heard before From the New York of, Marathon, right? Is that yes, saying? the improvement from the first marathon you ran, right. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. But uh, is that, does that happen in a marathon where you're pushing so hard, it's like uh, mm. you do the impossible? Well, I can tell you, I had a 10-minute improvement when I went from 219 to 209 in 75, and everybody was shocked, and they said an unknown and everything. <laughs> but I think, um, I think it's very, it would be very tough to go from 256 to 231. And um, I don't know, I think Rosie will have to resolve this for herself, you know. Rosie Ruiz today denied that she cheated to become the women's winner in Monday's Boston Marathon. But she faced tough questioning from critics who believe she may have given new meaning to the biblical observation, the race is not to the swift. Randy Daniels reports. Race. Rosie Ruiz won the women's division of the Boston Marathon, a grueling 26-mile race in record time. Her time was so stunning that few observers or participants believe she completed the entire course. Ruiz was an unknown with little technical knowledge of long-distance running. The fact that she won and was never seen by race officials or in videotapes of the marathon until the final stretch has sparked the biggest controversy in the history of the prestigious event. I doubt that she can do one mile at the speed she did the Boston Marathon. With Steve Merrick, president of the running club she joined only a week before the Boston race, Ruiz went before a hostile press in New York to defend her performance. If this is a carnival, I'm taking her out, believe me. The 26-year-old administrative assistant denied that she cheated in the Boston Marathon or in the New York race that qualified her to run in Boston. The way the race is run, Ruiz said any unknown who won would face the same pressure. I do not believe that there is enough coverage for women in any of the races. I believe that maybe after this, whether you prove me guilty or not, which I am not, there will be more coverage of women crossing the finish line during 26 miles. It's not fair. Ruiz declined the offer of a New York newspaper to run the same distance again for $1,000, but said she was willing to take a lie detector test to prove that she did not cheat. I had one minute to feel that I had won the race. And every moment after that has been a nightmare. Marathon officials are expected to make a decision soon whether to take back her marathon medal. If they take my title away from me, um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs>
Randy Daniel, CBS News, New York. And that's the way it is. Thursday, April 24th, 1980. Little information is established about Rosie Ruiz, also known by her family as Rosa. Born in Havana, Cuba during the Cuban Revolution by the year of 1953, her family fled to Florida after the Bay of Peak invasions and just before the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Rosa grew up within a small, poverty-stricken community of just over 2,500 of the western tip of southern central Florida. Although Memphis itself was small, it's part of a metropolitan area despite its fallen plantation prominence from the antebellum period. When she was old enough, Rosie moved to New York City during the early 1970s where she found work as a clerk with Metal Traders, a commodities firm. No doubt feeling invisible all her life, despising poverty along the way, by the time she emerged into her 20s, she sought out recognition in 1979. But commitment had never been her strong suit. Because she turned in her application late for the New York Marathon, she resolved to lie about her health, claiming that she was dying from brain cancer, something she never proved, but at the time, who in the right mind would question a dying woman's request? Therefore, Rosie was allowed to enter without further hesitation. Now, supposedly, she ran this marathon in under three hours. The New York race gave her a loophole to then slide into the prominent Boston Marathon. Her boss had been impressed and offered to pay for the Boston Marathon. No other requirements were needed. Her eight days of glory ranked her as the third fastest female recorded in any marathon. Her reputation soon collided with heightened suspicions, however. Men's winner, Bill Rogers, who had won his third Boston Marathon, observed Rosie's lack of knowledge about intervals and splits. Other observers noticed she had not been panting or was coated in sweat, while her thighs were less muscular than what would be expected of a world-class runner. As the inconsistencies harvested suspicions, witnesses from both the New York and Boston marathons emerged out of the cluster. Two Harvard students, John Faulkner and Zola Mahoney, saw Rosie sprint out of the crowd of spectators on the Commonwealth Avenue, half a mile from the finish. Not long after that, freelance photographer Susan Morrow reported accompanying her from the New York subway to the race on the pretense that Rosie had injured herself while running. Many believed she repeated the subway plan in Boston as well. Rosie was finally disqualified for both marathons, Canadian Jacqueline Gouraud being the official winner of the women's race two weeks following Rosie's boss, shortly thereafter, fired her. Why would someone like Rosie Ruiz cheat and lie? It had only been 12 years since the first woman attempted to run in the Boston Marathon, who was attacked for being the only woman at the time. And the last women's march occurred just two years prior. Despite her claim that there weren't enough coverage for women in any race being a true statement, she was right that after her exposure, there were indeed more women crossing the 26-mile finish line in record time. But her outrage of the unfairness has one to ponder, rather, was it unfair for women in general or that she got caught? There are more difficult lies. Number one, people take what is not rightfully theirs. They, they do it to get something that isn't theirs. I mean, there's a sense of entitlement. It's like, I, I want this, and I, I can't have it, so I'm gonna lie to get it in some way. They do it to escape accountability. They create a fantasy, a false self-esteem to escape their mundane life. They do it to avoid punishment. Sometimes they do it to inflict pain. They do it to feel better in the moment, to steal admiration. They don't earn the admiration, they steal admiration. If they take my title away from me, um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. There's an old expression that is really quite insulting about narcissists and that is if their lips are moving that they're lying. It's a horrible saying. 
But it's so sad that after being in the presence of a narcissist, no matter how much you want to believe that what they're telling you is the truth, you don't know what you actually can believe or what not to believe. Because the truth of the matter is, and I truly believe this, a lot of the time they don't know either. Why do narcissists lie and why do they struggle to tell the truth? Why do they often lie even when there's no apparent reason for them to lie? I believe that maybe after this, whether you prove me guilty or not, which I am not, Narcissists pathologically lie because they are a fictitious character. They are a false self. They are not real as in the sense of what we know is real. The narcissist is living in their own little mirage, constructing life in a way that they would like it to be, that at times bears no resemblance to reality. It's not fair. I had one minute to feel that I had won the race. And every moment after that has been a nightmare. The consciousness of this cancerous, toxic entity that has taken over the narcissist only extends to getting narcissistic supply. So lying is as necessary for that as it would be for any imposter who was not welcome trying to fit in undetected. So that is a narcissist and unless they meet, go to and love and heal and revive their inner being back to health and shift out the trauma and the ego, there is not going to be a shift to integrity. It's not going to happen. Because no criminal charges were laid against Rosie Ruiz, being more of a moralistic dilemma, she did not learn her lesson. With her ego unchecked two years later and just half an hour before she was ready to run the Boston Marathon again, she was arrested. She embezzled $60,000 from Stevens Real Estate, where she had worked as a bookkeeper. Her co-workers had wondered how she was able to live such a luxurious lifestyle, which included ski trips and living in Greenwich Village. She served one week in jail for grand larceny and forgery with a five-year probation attached to her term. She moved to Miami and 18 months later was arrested for attempting to sell cocaine to an undercover cop. This time, she spent 23 days in jail. A trail of lawsuits from her former landlords ensued. In 1986, she married. Her surname changed to Vivas, but she divorced two and a half years later. She was arrested again in 1987 for another cocaine charge. Since that time, she never ran another marathon, and notably, had never admitted to cheating. Rosie blamed her short hair, which was the reason the judges overlooked her, believing her to be a man rather than a woman. She further blamed politics for stripping away her title, claiming the reasons were due to her being an amateur. Still boasting about her victory was a triumph for women in sports, never mind about the others who had genuinely made history. Her infamous hubris didn't disappoint. She insisted on having evidence, a collection of photos, and other sources from anonymous people to prove that she had been in the race the entire time. However, she refused to show them in public. Her claim that she still possessed the sapphire and gold medal is questionable, stating that she wouldn't wear it in public in fear that someone might rip it off her neck. The closest she came to a confession was when she told the Palm Beach Post, It hurts me to know I did something so good but got so many problems. That is probably the truest statement she could ever claim evidence to. In 1998, working as a client representative for a medical lab company and living nearby Tequesta, she wrote to the Palm Beach Post, Rosie's name does keep popping up when acts of deception occur. 
Perhaps that individual is pulling a Rosie or a Rosie Ruiz. For fun, there had been a Boston Marathon group wearing t-shirts that project the Rosie Ruiz Running Club up until 1993. Former Boston winner Jacqueline Garreau surprisingly bumped into Rosie in Miami immediately upon Rosie introducing herself after a 10-kilometer race. When Jacqueline asked why she did it, Rosie replied, I ran it, I won it. Jacqueline asserted, forget it. When 2000 rolled around, Rosie did not show, not a peep nor a photo. She seemed to finally slip into the depths of pure anonymity. Although not on all accounts, sports columnist Adrian Wojnarowski wrote for the ESPN in 2005, 